uh, first of all to FEPS, to Elena and Anya and Celine for organizing this next lec uh, left lecture uh, and high level conversation with Professor Simon Hicks and also to all of you to, to be here and also to be connected. I see lots of familiar faces and it's a, it's a pleasure to, to have you here. We have a long session to discuss the, the likely political scenario and policy consequences of European elections <laughs> this year. So first of all, I will shortly introduce Ms. Uh, Professor Simon Hicks. Uh, as you probably have checked already, Simon is a British political scientist, holder since tw uh, 2021. A European political scientist. <laughs> British and European. I am a European political scientist. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I w my notes are, are... No, 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 I'm making a point about... It. Yes, yes, yes. Totally European political scientist. <laughs> Holder since 2021 of the Stain Rock and Chair in Comparative Pol Politics at European University Institute in Florence. He was also Harold Husky, Professor of Political Science and Pro-Director for Research at the London School of Economics and Political Scientist. He's expert, of course, in European Union politics, author of several books, an editor of international peer-reviewed European Union politics and founder and chairman of Boat Watch Europe, an influential online EU affairs think tank that probably all of you know, founded in London in, 20, uh, in 2009, that combines big data with political insight. Uh, so basically, uh, his expertise in, is in comparative political behavior, electoral systems and EU politics, He's known for accurate electoral predictions awarded by several prestigious organizations and he uh, works um, regularly with the Party of European Socialists. Okay, sorry. <laughs> oh, I, hope, I hope it was accurate. So basically I will do just a short introduction because today we are here to listen to him, to, to see which are, which are uh, his uh, predictions, his analysis for the European elections, these elections that are so important for, for all, of all of us, for the social democratic family and, and for Europe. Uh, we, we have been saying in the last month that we are facing crucial elections. Maybe we always say it, but I think in this case it's totally true. Uh, we are in this dilemma of uh, two different political Europe, uh, Europes. And basically we have been checking already some polls uh, in the last month, and also the, the study of ECPR, probably you will show it as well, and you have seen it one month ago, uh, which uh, says that uh, in nine countries of the European Union, the extreme right forces are in the leading position, and in other nine countries, they are in the second and in the third position. We have seen that, and with a lot of worry. So this would mean that we can see a big shift to the right in the next European Parliament. Uh, as, as, you, as you know, and I have here some colleagues, um, uh, MEPs, we have been working this term in several majorities, um, basically three, uh, in, in different topics, but uh, at the beginning of the term, uh, we started the, you know, the, the, the foundation of the term, the, the, the top jobs and the constitution of the European Parliament with the centrist majority. Here in the House, a lot of uh, MEPs and groups call it the von der Leyen coalition, of course, because we were the three groups that supported the, the Commission, uh, EPP, Renew and us. And with these three, I mean, this centrist majority, we set the basis of the, the main um, political fight, right? The Green Deal or the digital transition, so we, in the first term, uh, the first midterm of the of the, the term, sorry, the first two half and two and a half years, we have worked a lot on this. In some cases, ex extended it, extending it, sorry, to the Greens. Uh, so we have these four uh, pro-European forces that have been uh, working in in the majority of the files. But we have seen also two alternative majorities, as you know, the centrist right. Uh, that it goes from renew to the, to the right, uh, including ECR, ECR, sorry, and sometimes ID. In many cases, we have seen that, uh, especially 
maybe with economic issues, internal markets, um, some some migration files, uh, also, uh, and also another alternative majority, the center uh, left that we have used it as well, and it has given us a lot of leverage, I think, in terms of negotiating with PP, especially at the beginning of the term, if you remember, with the climate law and some environmental issues. We have seen that also with uh, gender issues, sexual and reproductive rights. We have used it as well in order to, to, to block EPP. So we have seen these three uh, big majorities, and this is something that is at risk at, uh, at these elections, and you, you will tell us how and in which sense. But uh, of course, it's something that it worries us if we see uh, that we cannot use this uh, leftist majority and we are only cornered with the centrist or the right wing majority. This will change a lot, of course, the big policies of the next term. So in this sense, I have some questions maybe for you and you will address it later. Uh, besides the, the, the forecast and the, and the, and the polls, uh, for us and for the progressive forces, uh, how can we mobilize our voters in terms of facing the extreme right um, parties raising? This is something that I ask myself a lot. If we have to, as the manual says, show a message of hope, uh, um, positive um, proposals, or um, mobilize a bit the fear, I'm sorry, because in the last campaign in Spain it worked, So, but I know it doesn't work always. So uh, fear or, or hope. Also, how we tackle EPP if we try to seduce him, seduce them in order to stay with us, or we have to very explicitly show the alliances that they form with ECR or the extreme right in many countries, and that we are also. Uh, I think that it's also useful for the voters that it's uh, what, what they will vote. And also, but this is maybe something that we have to discuss in other sessions, I think we as progressive, we need to do a reflection of how we can enlarge our family with parties that they are not part of the PS, but they are non-attached uh, and they are close to us. They vote with us and uh, it's, a, it's a way to not lose too many seats in the next term. So these are my questions. Thank you so much. The floor is yours. Muchas gracias. I need to share the screen. Yes. Uh, we're calling the person that is hosting the, the WebEx. So it's right here. Because you can't share unless I am the host. Sorry. Give me one second. <coughs> Sorry, folks. We've got some technical issues here. Ah, it's working now. It's working? Can everybody see that online? Is that was full screen, see if people can see it? Only people... In the room can see it. Yeah. No, and also online. Yeah. So everything is okay. Yep, yeah, they can't see it in the room. It's not possible to make it bigger. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I need to see the whole screen. No. While we're figuring out this out, let me start off by saying it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, as I made at the beginning. I'm, it's nice to be European again. I'm back in Florence at the EUI and I'm here as a professor from the EUI, not as a British citizen. I've been studying European elections since before some of you were born, I would imagine. I was a I was a assistant in the parliament in 93 to 94 when I wrote the history of the PES group, uh, which I think is still partly being used. I was let loose on the archives as part of my PhD thesis in Florence. And I've worked on the group itself and voting in the parliament since then. Um, and this is, I think, the fifth round of European elections that I've been involved in forecasting. So we have honed our skills in trying to do this. So what I'm going to present you today is a couple of things. I'm going to talk to you about the forecast that we just released with the European Council for Relations. Um, and we're going to be updating that in the next month. And it'll be on my website um, with the new updated model. 
Uh, I'm also going to talk about some research I've been doing with Abdul Nouri on the voting patterns in the current parliament. And some of what I'm going to show you today is going to come out in a report for CIEPS in Stockholm um, that will be released uh, next month. Uh, you know, with a more so it's I'm putting together different things. So this is joint work with Kevin Cunningham from uh, Dublin and uh, Abdul Nouri from uh, NYU Abu Dhabi. So I'm going to talk about the two different ways of forecasting the elections. Um, to, so you understand how we do it in contrast to how, say, Europe elects and Politico does it. I'll then talk about what we know about coalitions and cohesion in the current parliament. To think about those questions that you asked about how is this going to affect the sort of coalition balances and the type of policy issues in which they come together. And then I'll talk about what I think are the potential policy and political consequences. So the two ways to forecast uh, elections. One is what we call in the business a now cast. A now cast is where you just take current opinion poll standings. And the opinion polls actually ask voters, how would you vote if there were an election tomorrow? Well, the voters aren't stupid. They know there's not an election tomorrow. So, you know, opinion, there's always an, a gap between actually what's in an opinion poll and what actually happens in an election. That gap is smaller in national elections than it is in European elections. In national elections, when you ask people how they're going to, you know, how are you going to vote if an election were held tomorrow, they're actually answering, how am I going to vote? I know the election's not tomorrow. I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you how I'm going to vote when the election comes up in a few months or whatever. But of course, currently opinion polls across the member states are asking people, how would you vote if a national election were held tomorrow? They're not yet asking people, how would they vote in a European election? Apart from, I don't actually think yet any member states have got polls that are asking that yet. So we're still relying on polls that are asking people, how would you vote if a national election were held tomorrow? And when we, you, people take those polls and they use those to predict what would happen in a European election in a several months from now, right? So when you look at the way that uh, Politico or uh, Europe Elects do it, and they do a great job, but what they do is they take national opinion poll standings of parties in national elections today and extrapolate to the European elections in six months. What we know about European elections is they're systematically different to, to national election opinion polls. And they're systematically different in several ways. Well, there's a lot lower turnout. And so and there's differential turnout. Different types of people stay home. Unfortunately, younger voters tend to stay home. And younger voters tend to vote for different parties than older voters do. That's the first thing. The second thing is people vote differently than if it were a national election. Not everybody, but a certain number of voters vote differently. And they vote differently in two several regards. One is they vote against, they tend to vote against the national incumbent. They use European elections as a protest vote against parties in government and against larger parties. And the second thing is they use European elections to express their preferences on policy issues they care about, in particular two, one, environment issues, and two, immigration. And so what tends to happen in European elections is Green parties do slightly better than the opinion poll standings. Greens are very down in the polls right now. They, they, they will probably do slightly better than their national opinion poll standings in European elections. And the second thing, anti-Europeans might do even better than their current national opinion poll standards, populism, radical right in particular. So what, what we do in a forecast is we take the last two rounds of elections, 2014 and 2019, and we take the polls six months ahead of those elections and say, how well do the polls predict actually what happened? And what other information do we have about those parties? The other information we have, so actually, I'll, I'll come back to that. But, but so another way of doing it is we build a statistical model which is based on a lot of information we know about parties plus the opinion polls. And it's like a model to correct the opinion polls, if you like, to predict what happens in the election. And we build that model based on studying the 2014 and 2019 elections. So that's what I'm showing you on the screen here is the, the latest now cast from Europe Elects, which is, you know, they do a, a great job collecting all the, all the polls and saying if, the, if a European election were held tomorrow and if in that European election voters would vote the way they do in a national election, that would be the outcome of the election. Okay, fair enough. Let's just know what we're talking, looking at here. And what you can see there is they show, you know, uh, shift to the right in the parliament, growth in populist rights, fewer seats for the Greens, a few fewer seats for the Socialists, uh, a few fewer seats for Liberals. 
Now, modeling approach, as I said, what we do is we, we look at the previous national elections, the previous European elections, and, and we correct them. And what we do when we study those elections, we find that the opinion polls do pretty well. They predict around 78% of what a party gets in the European elections. But there's another 22% that, that, of variation that is not explained by opinion polls. And that's systematically explained by how many votes the party won at the previous national election. They revert back a little bit, because once a campaign begins, the big parties start campaigning and, and the bigger parties have the, have the resources to campaign. So there's a little bit of a reversion back to the last national election. Social Democrats and Liberals tend to do worse. Well, they definitely did worse in 2014 and 2019 than their opinion poll standings. Greens and anti-Europeans did better than their opinion poll standings. Right? So, so just a little bit. So we plug all that into the mix and we take the national opinion polls and we say... Let's correct those national opinion polls using what we know happened in 2014 and 2019. And we get this picture. So the ring in the middle there are the current seats. And the ring on the outside are a forecast seat. Um, so what you can see here is several things. The first thing is that big growth in support for the two groups or in the representation of the two groups to the right of the EPP, ECR and ID. Um, and that is around about a quarter of all seats in the parliament on the populist right. Um, and together those two groups are likely to have more seats than either EPP or S&D. Second thing is, as you see, a sort of shift rightwards. Of course, so the, the, the average, the median MEP is no longer in the Liberals in RE for the first time. So the first time since 1979, since the Parliament's been elected, the median, the average MEP is not in the Liberals. This is important for coalitions. As we know, you know, coalitions in the Parliament form issue by issue, vote by vote, amendment by amendment. They're often not formal coalitions. They're more informal on some issues, and then they're just kind of ad hoc, and they come together just depending on how people vote. So the location of the average member of the parliament is actually a pretty good predictor of what happens because if you just look at who's on the winning side in votes, up to now the Liberals have been on the winning side more than any other group because either they're on the winning side in a centrist coalition or they're on the winning side with a coalition forming on the left or they're on the winning side with a coalition forming on the right. They're on the winning side. Once you move the average MEP to the EPB, the EPB suddenly become the pivotal group. So the median member of the parliament will be the I quote, quote unquote, left wing of the EPP, the kind of the liberal wing, the kind of Scandies, the, the Finns, the Irish. The, the, they'll be the pivotal members of the parliament in the next parliament. And they will be quite critical. And this, I think, could lead to some interesting politics inside the EPP, because I don't think this is a group that likes the idea that EPP starts to lean rightwards. When we think about you know, my friend Alex, who's just been elected president of Finland, he's definitely not a fan of leaning rightwards type uh, member of the EPP. Um, the other thing, of course, is, the, is the, the three main groups that have classically formed the traditional centrist coalition will still have a majority, but they'll be considerably smaller, and I'll come back to that. And if you look, compare our predictions. So here you've got the current EP and the stripes there, the Hicks-Cunningham one in the orange, and the Europe elects one in the green. Um, you can see it's pretty similar. But what our model is doing is giving a few more seats to the populist right, a few more seats to the Greens, and a few less seats to the EPP and S&D. So the way to think about this is if the same dynamics happened in this election as happened in 2014 and 2019, that's the, more or less the outcome we're likely to get. Now, the dynamics, of course, can be different. And there's a problem whenever you fit a prediction model for an election is you're fitting it on the last election, and the next election stuff happens differently. But, but if broadly the same kind of things will happen in terms of turnout, in terms of an anti-incumbency effect, in terms of mobilization against migration, in terms of mobilization on environment issues, that you'll, you'll get that slight uh, boost of support for Greens and for the populist right, and slightly lower for the EPP and S&D, the big incumbent parties, if you like. We will, I mean, the big story, I think, in the media is going to be the populist breakthrough at the European level. Of course, we've seen in the national level in a lot of member states across Europe, 
um, populist radical right parties becoming the largest party or the second largest party or the third largest party becoming a pivotal player, most recently, of course, Chega in Portugal. Um, and so, you, you know, the story in many member states across Europe is, has already been, I mean, I live in Italy, Meloni is now prime minister, um, and we can look around Europe and we think about the Netherlands with Wilders, and we think about the last Swedish election with S&D, uh, with the S uh, social Swedish Sweden Democrats becoming a pivotal coalition partner. Uh, we think about Belgium and the populace in Belgium. I think about Finland and the true Finns. I mean, all the way across Europe, you can see at certain points in different elections, the populist right broke through and became a pivotal party for the formation of government or the formation of the type of coalition that was going to form. These elections could see the same kind of thing at the European level, if you like. If you think about how big that block is going to be. The, our prediction model, and also Europe elects, are predicting nine, in nine member states, the populist right will come top of the polls. And in the nine other member states, they'll come second or third. So that's a lot. Pretty much all of them. Apart from Denmark and Ireland. <laughs> we look at the coalition sizes. Um, in the grey there is the current parliament. Uh, you can see the Grand Coalition fell below, the, of the two largest groups, fell below 50 at the last election. I'm going to carry on falling. Even the super grand centrist sort of von der Leyen coalition, if you like, will be over 50%, but it'll be down considerably. Um, and I'll come back to it, because even when it does vote together, there is very low cohesion amongst EPP and Renew in the current parliament, much lower than in the previous parliament. And so that coalition hasn't been as strong or as powerful as it has been in the past. And so when it starts to lose seats with low cohesion, it might not win a majority. You see the centre-left coalition there in the green. Um, in the current parliament, the centre-left coalition, which is when the Liberals vote with the left parties, has tended to win on some crucial things like environment. You mentioned the Green Deal. I'll come back to that. There was a few very close votes on environment. But they managed to win because they were backed by some members of the EPP, that more liberal wing of the EPP in particular. Um, but this time round, they're going to be a lot smaller. Very, it's going to be much more unlikely that that block is going to be able to win crucial votes. And when we go to the bottom there, for the first time, there's a possibility of a populist right majority with the EPP voting with ECR, ID, and Fidesz. And Fidesz, we don't know where they're going to go. I'll come back to that. But if you, if you think about, we've got to add them in, they're quite a large party, 14 seats, they're probably going to win. Um, they, together, will have a majority for the first time in the parliament, which is a kind of horrific thought if you're a social democrat. There's some group, un there's some uncertainty of membership, and I think you alluded to a little bit of that at the beginning with your comments. Um, we don't know where Fratelli d'Italia is going to go. We have them staying in ECR. I have a feeling they will stay in ECR. They have, we know that there has been uh, discussions between EPP and Fratelli d'Italia about them possibly joining. Forza Italia are not happy about that, of course, but Forza Italia are in decline post Berlusconi. I actually think she will stay in ECR because it's she, she's going to be a big fish. It's her group. She's she runs president. the show. And she's she's the president the party. of the party. She's the she's she, she's get, she has the ear of the commission president. She's like, why would she change? It's you know she's the big fish right now in that group. Um, and and of course the other issue that no people think, people think about it, she will be bigger than the CDU in terms of number of MEPs. And the Germans won't want somebody bigger than them in the EPP. So, <laughs> uh, so I think I think she probably will stay in ECR. Fidesz, uh, we have them in non-attached. I have a feeling they're going to go in ECR. It was a, what, quite amazing to me how quickly Law and Justice left an olive branch to Orban. Um, when you think about the fact that what has divided them in the past has been their views of Putin. Um, and I think now Law and Justice is in opposition in Warsaw. It makes it easier for them to do a deal and get Orban into the group. I think he'd rather be in ECR with Maloney, with Law and Justice, than he would be in ID. And that will, if that happens, um, I, ECR will be the third largest group in the world. Five Star. We well, don't know where Five Star are going to go. I think you might have been alluding to potentially Five Star <laughs> coming into S and D. Um, this, of course, is the million euro question in Italy itself about the, what happens with Cinque Stella and and uh, and PD. 
in Italy, they, had they done a deal at the last Italian election, we could have a very different government in Rome, but they didn't and we don't. Um, so the, I think there is a big issue there about what happens to Five Star in the medium term and perhaps some kind of reconciliation in the European Parliament could be a precursor of what happens domestically. So, so that, that would be an interesting possibility. But they're the big ones to, to talk about, to think about where they go. Yeah. Um, and so there's some uncertainty. A lot of the smaller ones, a lot of the uncertainty is on the right. So the overall story, you know, whether they're in ECR or ID or in non-attached, a lot of them are on the right. There's a whole, you go down that list and there's one or two numbers uh, with smaller uh, group. And, and, you know, but most of that uncertainty is over on the right. Will, will uh, I don't know where SMAR is going to go. I assume they're going to stay in ID for now. What about HLAS? Will they end up in uh, Will they end up in socialists? It's only three MEPs probably. Um, so there, there's some there's some uncertainty. But most uncertainty is on the right, so it doesn't change the overall picture. Now we can move on to the policy implications. So if you look, um, we've got what we've done is we've looked at all the votes in the current parliament. There's about eighteen thousand roll call votes so far, and we're going to be launching a website. So we had Vote Watch running, and Vote Watch ran out of money sadly. Um, and because nobody wanted to fund anything like that. Um, but we have now found a way through EUI and Bocconi to come up with a project together to launch a sort of Vote Watch 2.0, a lighter version of it, and we're going to launch it ahead of the elections. Um, and, uh, and so we, and then we'll have the kind of same kind of thing where you can look at a vote, look at the vote map, and you'll be able to download all the data you want for free. Um, um, but looking at the voting patterns so far in the parliament, you can see the different types of coalitions form. That sort of centrist grand coalition has tended to form and win on budgetary questions, culture and education, EMU, foreign affairs, particularly Ukraine votes, <coughs> internal market, legal affairs, transport and tourism. A centre-left coalition has tended to win votes on environment, civil liberties and justice and affairs, particularly uh, migration, development, employment and social affairs, and women's rights and gender equality. Centre-right coalition, without the socialists, has tended to win on only a small number, occasionally on international trade votes, where the socialists have sometimes been split, agricultural or development, fisheries, industry and research. So what is likely to happen is some of those topics or policy areas that, you, that sit in that centre-left column will probably shift over and become centre-right majority issues. And this is the big worry. So we have in the slides here, and I can share them with you, and in the CEPs report that's coming out, um, we're going to have a lot more of these that you'll be able to see. We've got them by all policy areas. So this shows the percentage of times the two groups voted together in all the roll call votes in the parliament. So you can see how the EPP and S&D, on average, 73% of the time they voted together. But bear in mind, a lot of votes are not contentious, so you get big majorities voting together. You can see how EPP voted with the... The, with Renew, 80% of the time, with, EC, with uh, ECR, 62% of the time, with S&D, 73, and S&D voted with Renew, 87, and S&D voted with the Greens, 83. So on average, there was a slightly left-leaning sense of the votes in the Parliament. The Grand Coalition, but slightly tilted leftward, is the average sort of structure of votes you've seen in the current Parliament. International trade is an example where you've seen a sort of right-wing and you can see how ECR voting 90% of the time with Renew and 91% of the time with uh, EPP. Uh, socialists voting 90% of the time with Renew and so on. So you can see how socialists uh, voting, so joining that sort of centre-right liberal block as a free trade block. But the socialists divided on a lot of these issues. This is just the plurality of the socialist vote. One of the cleanest examples is, of, is on environment votes. Lots, over 2,000 votes on environment issues in the current parliament. Europe, European Green Deal votes came through. I'm going to talk a little bit about the nature restoration law vote. Um, we just had the package just get passed. Um, and you can see how on that vote, it's clearly a left-wing block that wins on those votes. You can see RE voting 90% of the time with the Socialists, 80% of the time with the Greens. And you can see the dark colours there is the block. The left, the Greens, S&D and Renew Europe. Together they form a majority, sometimes with a, with a few EPP members voting with them. As I've been alluding to, cohesion varies in the Parliament. So these are the average cohesion scores 
across a few policy issues. Again, in the CEPs report, we're going to show all policy issues um, for you. What's remarkable is how cohesive the Greens have become. Um, and this is something to bear in mind when we think about those groups on the right, because in the past, in previous parliaments, Greens were not cohesive at all. Sort of 20 years ago, the Greens were not cohesive. And everyone said, oh, the Greens are going to increase in size. Who cares because they're not cohesive? In fact, the opposite happened. They increased in size and they got their act together because they were now bigger and because if they got their act together, they could be influential. So in a sense, cohesion is endogenous to power. You get power, you get size, you start to organize. So you see how there's low ECR and low ID cohesion on average there? Once ECR starts to get powerful, they have an incentive to start to organize, start to organize whips, organize internal party meetings, get up to discipline their members, monitor how they vote, and so on. Do the sort of things that have become the standard for those groups on the center and the center left. And so don't assume ECR are going to carry on being weak and unpowerful and uncoordinated. I think they could well increase their coordination. And you see how they're very coordinated there on internal market questions. So an average Greens are the most highest. You can see cohesion really a little bit lower in foreign affairs for the socialist group, very low for the left, so a lot of these votes on, on, on uh, Russia. EPP, uh, not very cohesive on environment there, divided on environment issues. Um, so 100 means they, everyone in the party votes the same way on all votes. Zero means they're split down the middle in every single vote. So a baseline, national parliaments, you get around 90% cohesion. In the US Congress, you get around 75% cohesion in the two parties in the US Congress. So, so you can see how uh, I'm having to share these slides. Because, so EPP, lower cohesion <coughs> on environment. I put in artificial intelligence there because these were a set of votes that came out of the special committee on artificial intelligence and digital age. Um, uh, lots of the new kind of digital, I expect over the next five years, we're going to see quite a lot of votes on regulation of tech, regulation of artificial intelligence, regulation of social media, these sorts of issues. We're going to see that as a major policy issue coming at the European level as it is through Congress, the same kind of thing in the US. And so it, it's an interesting issue. I don't, you can see very low levels of cohesion except amongst the Greens on those sorts of issues. So it's a new policy issue. And I don't think the groups yet have figured out what their key position is on those sorts of questions. Example here of how the makeup of the parliament could change the politics in the parliament was the nature restoration law vote, 12th of July 2023. Probably the most publicised vote in the last parliament, if you look at media coverage of the votes. So the vote passed by 12 votes. So this was a, this was a kind of sneaky proposal by Weber to throw out the commission deal. So the my, my, my daughter was born. Oh, I had to leave the party. He was not there. We were talking about it. She was not there, but okay. thankfully, yeah. Yeah. thankfully, it was like that. Yeah. Um, so you see how uh, he, it was a proposal to reject the nature restoration law, um, and I switched it just to pro environment, anti environment, so you can understand rather than pro and against, because it's, otherwise it's kind of counterintuitive. And you can see how that the left block plus 15 EPP MEPs, so I think this was Fine Gael plus uh, I think the Finns and uh, some of the Swedes um, uh, and some Baltics uh, broke from the EPP and they were, they were pivotal here. You see how RE is split and EPP is split and this, they, they're split on a lot of environment questions. Um, but the vote was passed by 12 votes. Now, if you if you just take, how did each national delegation vote in that vote? How big would the national delegation be now be in our forecast? So if the national delegation was split 50-50, let's assume they're also going to be split 50-50 if we re-ran the vote today. Except the vote would fall, and you can see how it would fall by 321 in favour to 393 against... Um, Big, big, big majority again. So that gives you an indication of how much the shift in the parliament will shift the, the members of the parliament in a more environment sceptic, opposed to radical climate change um, position in the parliament. This is, I think, you can see this already with you know the mobilization of farmers across Europe and how the populist right are having mobilized uh, anti Europeanism, then mobilized anti immigration. The latest thing is anti environment. And using that, and you know, adding this to their another string to their bow, if you like. Oh, look, let's jump on climate change and and how the the elites are not caring about the little people on climate costs. 
you know, why should we have to pay for this stuff? And you can see that's the rhetoric that you get now mobilizing amongst the farming communities in the rural areas. Um, and that, I think, is also helping raise their support in a lot of respects. And we go back to the von der Leyen. Mm -hmm. um, let's call oh, it Von der Leyen. Yeah, <laughs> mention von der Leyen. <laughs> so you said it was a von der Leyen, it was a von der Leyen coalition that got her elected. You're right, it was the EPP, S&D and RE. Together in the last parliament, 58% of the MEPs in the vote, which of course is by secret ballot, she has to win an absolute majority. She won barely 51% of the vote. A lot of S&D did not back her. It's a secret ballot, so you know who voted for her and I don't, right? So <laughs> you, in the group know, you in the group know who did and who didn't, because of, because of, you know, unless you don't tell each other. Um, but it was a, and also I think it's pretty clear there was some EPP and some our Renew Europe, who also didn't support her. So if you think that that super grand coalition is not 58, is now 54, and if you think with the same level of cohesion they had when they were 58, now applying to 54, she would not win. There isn't a pro von der Leyen majority in the parliament if she relies on those three groups. Hence why I think she's tilting rightwards to kind of try and get ECR on board. But if she gets ECR on board, does what do the Socialists and Democrats do? I think the key question is, who did these moderate EPP members want? Would they rather have a commission president who tilts rightward? Or would they rather have a more moderate centrist commission president? So I think there's still, this is up for grabs. I don't think it's a shoe in that she is going to be re-elected as easily as perhaps she might have thought a few months ago. I'm just trying to stir the pot. Um, so, in sum, whether you take our forecasting model or whether you take the <coughs> of uh, Europe Lex or uh, Politico or act, you're, you're active or whatever, any of them, you, you will get the same similar sorts of outcomes, which is, as of right now, it looks like we're going to see a big swing to the right in the park. With the average MEP in the EVP group and not in RE, with a populist right block, potentially with 50% of the seats and a centrist centre plus left coalition, less than 50% of the seats. Highly unstable coalition, so in a much weaker super grand centrist block, a new potential right-wing majority on environment questions and migration, where these are issues where the centre-left has traditionally won, but now we think we could see the centre-right winning on these questions. Um, but these effects will depend on cohesion levels for ECR and ID, as well as cohesion of EPP, particularly on environment questions. And I think we, we are going to see a big fight in the EPP about how far they lean rightwards. Whether There is clearly a wing of the EPP that would not feel happy with that. That's trying to maintain a cordon sanitaire with groups to their right. As a result of all this, I don't think it will be as simple for von der Leyen to get re-elected as she might have thought. It will depend on the position of SD, and it will depend on the cohesion of the EPP group in particular. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. And how is Malik? Yeah, I, I have to leave in 20 minutes. So. No, no, I'm not going to talk to <laughs> uh, Well, first, I'm impressed. I'm impressed by the depth, the, how advanced is the, is the research, is the analysis of, uh, of, the, uh, of the boat, of the, uh, um, of the polling activity, and of uh, the 